Hey guys, this is Toby Mathis. Jeff Webb. And you're watching, now you're watching Tax Tuesday. Welcome to 2021's first, first Tax Tuesday of the year. Let's make sure we get some people on. We'll have some people loading up. Uh, while you're loading up, let's go over some of the new rules because we are using Zoom now. So we've done many, many events on Zoom. We switched over from the GoToWebinar accounts and now we are just Zooming it. Uh, so on Zoom, you have question and answer and you have chat features. What we're gonna ask is that if you're going to ask questions, that you do it, ver do, uh, do it via the question and answer as opposed to the chat, because the chat will just fly through too quickly. We won't be able to see it all. Uh, whereas if you do question and answer, we can't get rid of it until we answer it. <laughs> so, so it sticks in our face until we actually get it done. And don't worry. It's not just Jeff and I answering questions. Jeff doesn't even have a computer to type on. I don't even have a phone. We took away all of his toys so that uh, he's not allowed to have anything except a mask. Uh, <laughs> someone's, someone's in DC. Hey, I'm gonna ask you guys where everybody's at in the world. Why don't we just do that? If you can go to chat and say where you're at in the world. So we've got uh, South Carolina, Miami, oh my goodness, Alaska, Virginia, Denver, Westminster, Hudson Valley, Rose Hill, Scottsdale, <laughs> Utah, California, it's going so fast, it's flying. Southern California, Cape Cod, Fremont, Irving, San Francisco, Bakersfield, SoCal. Wow, we got a lot, Port Orchard. Oh, you're up there by Clint. Yeah. Some Scandinavians, some Las Vegas, San Diego, Raleigh, North Carolina, New York, Virginia, Orlando. Gosh, we got you guys from everywhere. Honolulu, I'm jealous. Uh, boy. Anyway, you can ask what is the, what is the big day tomorrow? Uh, we're gonna see what goes on with our wonderful Congress, and the certification of our election. There's somebody from Pennsylvania. I grew up in Philadelphia myself. Groff from Chicago. Minoy, North Dakota is that Minoy? I imagine it must be spelled that way. You know these things better. Can I you actually know, read I don't that? Know you guys, uh, please do not use my name. Somebody says, yeah, we uh, keep the, uh, on the question and answer, if you put anonymous, then we'll never even see your name. And that's what I'd actually prefer. Yeah. As long as when I ask you a question, I may say, hey, somebody is asking a question about a single family with a Roth. You don't have to put your full name. You could just say, um, you can, you can put in there just the scenario. Look at this, we got so many Elmhurst, Napa, Houston. My not, aha, my not. I knew I was saying it wrong. We used to, Seattle, go Hawks. Yeah, what, 11-4, did a great job. There's uh, Bellevue, Washington, Austin, Texas, Greensboro, North Carolina, All right? So we have a whole bunch. So when you're asking questions, uh, you can always just put your first name or just click anonymous. And that way, uh, what we do, you other people will not see your question unless we answer it, and and we forget to click, uh, make sure it's anonymous. So I have, uh, we have Pio, we have Elliot, Thomas, we have Patty, Tavia, uh, Susan, all on, and they're going to be answering questions. Uh, probably Elliot and Pio, doing the accountant work. Tavia does lots of bookkeeping. And uh, somebody says, home of the Gonzaga Bulldogs. That must be Spokane. We call it Spokane. Spokane, yeah. that's why it's spelled. When you're down in your luck and you pick up truck, Spokane. See if you can cite the song. Lawrenceville, Georgia. I used to play oh, against- Georgia, okay. Yeah, so I used to uh, play against Gonzaga. I played for CLU. I was a soccer guy, so uh, back in the day. So I remember going to Spokane many a time. All right, so we have lots of cool folks. Uh, Somebody says, if they come to Vegas, will you buy me a steak? Of course. Anybody, uh, anybody who's come here that's that's hit me up knows that I like to go places, and the, the strip is a little different nowadays. Yeah. But it's still there's still some things open. Uh, I think we're a little different than some states. I think we're at twenty five percent though in the restaurants. Yeah. So you just have to have uh, what is it uh, reservations. Yeah. So I have lots of reservations, not necessarily to restaurants. All right, so you ask your question, Q&A, we'll get to you. Um, 
there's some good questions already coming in, which we'll, we'll get knocking around. Quite often they'll flag them for me to answer. Uh, if you don't get your question answered, then just type it in, type in a, an email to us at tax Tuesday at Anderson Advisors. It happens, stuff goes fast. You'll have a hundred questions at the same time. So we're pretty good about getting through them, but every now and again, somebody falls through the cracks. We wanna make sure we're getting you. If you need specific advice for you, you need to be a client. You need to be at least a platinum client so we can answer your questions uh, where we're actually giving you advice, specific advice for your situation. What this is, is tax knowledge. This is fast, fun, educational. This is, let's get it, uh, get, you know, rapid answers. Let's not say depends all the time. Let's get to actual answers. A lot of people are just scared of the liability of opening their mouth and giving an answer. Uh, Jeff and I don't necessarily share that. We'll give you, we'll give you advice. No, we think it through and we try to give you enough to, to go on so you can uh, get the right answer. All right, questions today. I think we had 15 or so, plus we'll have lots of questions and we're gonna try to get done on these ones reasonably on time, which means if you know me, we'll, we'll, we'll be on the hour, give or take an hour. <laughs> We'll be really close within 60 minutes, right? Uh, you wouldn't be mad if you were taking like an across the world flight and you're within 60 minutes, but people get all bent here because sometimes we go over. Um, somebody says they sent questions on Prop 19. We'll go over that. The Prop 19 is freaking some people out and we'll kind of go through it. All right. If we receive PPP in our business, then get approved for forgiveness, will we still be able to deduct the rents and utilities we applied the PPP to? We'll answer that. I recently read Elon Musk was moving his private foundation from California to Texas. Is there a tax advantage to moving a private uh, foundation or nonprofit uh, from California to Texas? We'll answer that. Do you have to be married in order to create an entity that allows you to hire your children? How does one set this up? We'll absolutely go through that. Um, can we add the minor to the title and still be able to remain uh, the stepped up benefit? So we'll, we'll go through what all that means and answer that. Do I file my business taxes with personal because I didn't make any money this year and I just paid out a lot? <laughs> I love those types. Uh, how long after the, the, the sale of a primary residence, the sale of a primary residence, uh, do you have to apply the proceeds to a new home purchase to avoid taxation? So we'll go over some of the, the, the nuances there. I'm 70 years old and haven't made a deposit to uh, my Roth in 10 years, so that's probably a Roth IRA. I, uh, am I free to withdraw all my account with no penalty or am I limited to my cost basis? So we'll go through all those. Jeff is a bastion of knowledge on those things. So that's gonna be great. I have an LLC tax as a sole proprietor, uh, but first year has zero, here, I'm gonna move my cursor. Where did it go? Uh, hmm, it's hiding. Let's see if I can make it. That's not going to show. Um, all right. I have an LLC tax as a sole proprietor, but first year has zero income. Can I deduct my home office up to 300 square feet in auto mileage? Uh, is there any case studies or are there any case studies on deducting groceries as a business expense? This is the ones that make Jeff's hair fall out. Uh, I know that forgiven PPP loans are not taxable. What about grants received under the CARES Act? Are government grants to relieve financial duress received by a medical practice under the CARES Act considered taxable income? So we'll go through all those. Uh, as a real estate salesperson, is it advantageous to have an LLC or just file a 1099? What is the best way to write off a cruise? And uh, somebody says, devastated by Prop 19 in California, is there any legal way to leave home to children so they can get parents' tax bases? Um, and that's gonna be for the property taxes, we'll answer that. In 2020, I bought uh, a lot, so not a lot of something, but a lot for $16,000, and then went under contract with a uh, contractor for $110,000 in escrow for draw. So they built a house on it. House is single family residence, currently under construction, do I claim the purchase as 16K and 110K as the first year expenses? It will generate rent in 2021. So good question and it's one that we're gonna, we'll, we'll dive into. That, that's one that you guys really wanna pay attention to because uh, it goes over the distinction between basis and uh, 
and deductions. And then uh, if my S Corp makes profit beyond my salary and distributions, I have to claim all that income on my per personal taxes uh, still too, right? Uh, so it's a nice question. Yeah, I always, guys, I just pick these off. I don't sit there and edit them. And uh, every now and again, I'll cut out some of the more egregious ones, but typically I, I try to keep your voice in it and not really touch them. Maybe, maybe I'll put punctuation at the end if it's just a period. And I'll say, hey, that's a question, question mark. Um, so if you're gonna yell at somebody, uh, I guess you could still yell at me for it. <laughs> Maybe, pass it on. maybe someday I'll start editing them. No, I just I just want your, your guys' questions. You got to understand what you Yeah, we've corrected a few spelling errors, but other than that. If, if Google's not yelling at me or whatever <clears throat> service, then I just kind of say whatever. If there's a bunch of red lines, sometimes I'll pay attention to it. All right. So if we received a PPP in our business, so a Paycheck Protection Program, it's the monies that is two and a half times your uh, your basically your, your wages, mm -hmm. um, average monthly wages, and then you get the forgiveness. So you've hit their thresholds, which was this moving target all the time, but we hit their thresholds. Can you deduct? And Jeff and I, we had lots of discussions about this. You heard us last year where we said, to heck with what the treasury says, we're just gonna deduct yes. it anyway, because we were ticked because we knew what Congress intended. The Congress said, not only do you not recognize it as income, but you get to write off the expenses. <clears throat> Otherwise, why make it to where you don't get to recognize the income if you're just gonna deny the expense? It's, 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 it's a flush. Um, it gets annoying. Yeah. So the treasury doubled down. They said twice, you can't deduct it. They, they did it once. Then Congress kind of wrote out this, you know, grassly, this scathing letter and then they they doubled down on it again and did it again well that just changed under this most recent uh tax act yeah the stimulus act uh yep definitely said that uh any loan forgiveness is not taxable the way it was in the original bill but it also said anything paid for by these pp loan ppp loans mm -hmm. uh, are fully deductible uh and there was a third part to this which is actually quite important is that it also said even though it's it's not taxable and you can still take the deductions uh, any ppp loan forgiveness gives you basis um, so if you got a hundred thousand dollar ppp loan and they forgave once they forgave that ppp loan your basis in your company would go up by that hundred thousand dollars it's it's still considered it's, book income but not tax income it's almost like they like you contributed the hundred thousand dollars to your business and it was given to you by your parents like here's a here's a gift now, throw it in there now there is one bit of complication because mm -hmm. of this is you may have expenses that you paid for in 2020 but you haven't had your loan forgiven yet so you can't you can't collect that basis you can't count that as income yet uh, so you may end up with some suspended losses that you'll be able to take in 2021 uh, once that loan is forgiven. Um, if, if you already have enough basis to take your losses, you, you have nothing to worry about. But yes, um, the loan's not taxable, the forgiveness isn't taxable, and everything's deductible at this point. Uh, somebody asked if the PPP is excused, so uh, you don't have to pay it back and you had to make a tax payment. So you're making a tax payment by 115, 2020. Will we not have to make that payment or will the penalty be worse? I'm not sure I quite understand that one. Well, if the loan hasn't been forgiven yet, then mm -hmm. it's not income period. It's still a loan to the SBA mm -hmm. or your local bank. Uh, if it has been forgiven, yeah, it's income to you, but it's not taxable income. So that's not gonna affect your 115 payment at all. Yeah, so so it's not, yeah, I guess the easiest way to look at it is it's free money without a tax implication. And when we say free money without a tax implication, we mean that you still get to write it off, you still get to use it for expenses and you can take that deduction. So it's like me giving a gift to Jeff of 10 bucks and he uses it to buy um, some widgets or not widgets, but he buys some office supplies. Mm -hmm. um, he gets to write off the $10. He doesn't have to show 
ten dollars. Well, in this case, it's even better because he doesn't she doesn't show the ten dollars as income. With the PPP loan, you'd actually show the ten dollars and as for your basis income and not as taxable income. Plus, it'd be like if I gave you a gift and then you contributed it to your company and then you wrote it off. Right there we go. Um, I, I mean, I've been doing this for thirty years. I don't know how long. Yet. I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. Uh, pretty much a gift from the government. We like it. All right. Uh, somebody says yes. We can see that. Uh, let's move to the next one. It is, uh, uh, Jeff, I agree with you. They, what they were really trying to do in my, in my personal opinion was they were saying, rather than have the states give unemployment, we'll give you the money and you dole it out. And so you may not need the people, but we'll give you the money to pay them. Right. And you just dole it out. And as we've seen, there was what, uh, it was billions of dollars of fraud in California. Nevada had to get sued before it would give uh, contractors the money. What we know for sure is the states pretty much universally suck at distributing monies. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna be cranky. All right, I recently read that Elon Musk was moving his private foundation from California to Texas. Is there a tax advantage to moving a private foundation or a nonprofit from California to Texas? Tax advantage, there's none. Um, the really big difference between the two is both states are highly regulated uh, for nonprofits. Uh, Texas is frankly cheaper to set up and register and run a foundation. Uh, it's cheap either. Yeah, I, I think California is more notorious for nickel and diming you for this tax form. And it, it's not, a lot, I, for Elon Musk, it, it's gonna make absolutely no difference at all. Right. The, the reason I believe that he was moving his foundation there was to create all indicia of everything he was doing out of Texas as opposed to California. So Elon Musk as an individual, they're going to want to tax his billions of dollars. Uh, California may still want to tax his growth. I think he made about $140 billion last year. They're going to want to tax that when he sells what Elon wants to do is show, here's the date that I left California. I moved my foundation, I registered my cars, I bought a new house, here I moved. They'll go into your utility bills to determine where were you living and they'll try to get you for a partial year or you know, mm -hmm. the, some stupid argument. Yeah, but, California is really notorious for finding very tenuous relationships. Yeah. Just to keep you as a resident. Go look at the case Hyatt v. Commissioner or uh, Board of Equalization. There we go. Uh, Hyatt v. Board of Equalization. It, it ended up going to the Supreme Court twice, but they sent agents to Nevada to dig through somebody's garbage. So they think that they're owed money and you had a substantial amount. Uh, California is about as aggressive as they come. So my guess is that he just moved it to make sure that he didn't have any ties to California where California could say, hey, you were running your private foundation you're here. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, I wasn't. I, was, I moved it to Texas. And that's all he did is he just, you can move a, a company just like you move individually. You don't have to worry about that. All right. Question and answers. Let's see if I can find some cues. I, one of the bad parts of this is, uh, is Zoom is that it's sometimes hard for me to find questions that have to do with things that are currently happening. So there's a lot of uh, somebody says AB 2088 was killed. So wealth tax died. They wanted to tax on just whatever money you have, but what they do look at is how, when you made your money. So part of Elon Musk is, uh, part of his compensation is deferred compensation. He's vesting, he's getting options all the time. That's where most of his wealth is held. Uh, and they're going to say, Hey, when did you make that? And then they're going to smack you around and say, great, that's taxable here. Yeah, a part of that wealth bill was also a new tax bracket for I think over 30 million, but it was a 16.3%, uh, way higher than anybody else. California's kind of, uh, they they lost some residents. I think they were negative uh, 60,000 residents this year. So my guess is they're gonna be looking for some money. I think they're all moving here. Uh, I think they move all over the country. If I talk to people from Texas, they're Texas, convinced. Yeah. You talk to Nevada, our real estate prices are going through the roof. They're up 10% over last year. 
and they blame all the Californians. Yep. They're fleeing California. But a uh, beautiful state, just uh, could do without some of the stuff that's happening there. And boy, talk about rough. Uh, if you're a restaurant owner there, my God. Um, I still believe that COVID lives in Costco. The day they shut down <laughs> Costco, because I would go to Costco, like the kids are going to laugh at this, but um, I'd always get an ice cream. And I'd walk around Costco with it because I hated having the mask. I like it. You could eat the ice cream and you're- Were you actively like, eating? Yeah. Kind of, okay. I would just wander around. I was I was that guy like, mm, and then with this, you know, I guess I'm horrible, but I don't know. I just, it was Costco. I was convinced that that that's where COVID goes. Any of the big box stores, when they close those down, I'll start listening to them. All right. Do you have to be married in order to create an entity that allows you to hire your children? How does one set this up? Uh, you can hire your children at any point. Mm -hmm. uh, key word is your children, whether you're married or not, they have to be your children. Mm -hmm. Start hiring other people's in-laws, nephews, stuff like that. And, and uh, some of the labor laws kick in. Uh, <laughs> well, so here's one thing. If you're a sole proprietor, you don't have to do any withholding if you're paying your kids. If you're an S corp and you're paying them and uh, then so people are, <laughs> see if they're mad at me for saying about Costco, but I was like, they never shut down. Uh, I always like your guys' messages, by the way, until you're saying mean things and then I don't like it. Um, if you're, so if you are um, a, a sole proprietor, you could pay your kid and just pay them directly. If it's an S corp, you got to pay them through, um, you could pay them through payroll. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do that, then somebody's asking a good question, like how old do they have to be? As long as it's active income, you can set up an IRA um, in their name. It might be a custodial IRA to where like you're setting it up for them, but it's their money that's going in there. And then when they hit 18, uh, then they get it. Somebody says, when you say pay them directly, like via checking account, yes, you could pay them cash, you could pay them Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. Technically, I could pay Jeff with a car. So uh, an important uh, difference Lambo? is- Lamborghini. Lamborghini, yeah. Uh, we saw a broken down one the other day. Uh, so the important difference is uh, if, you, if you do want to do this truly tax-free to your children, you need to put them on payroll. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they have that standard deduction up to 12,000, was it 12.4 mm -hmm. right Which, now? It was 12.4 for 2020. Uh, 20. So it might be up a little, it's probably, but, but it's, it's over $12,000 that you, if you have children, mm -hmm. they should be working for you. And this is another thing. Like if I have, Je like, let's say Jeff was my dad. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I could say, hey, dad, I want to help out. And maybe you're giving your parents money. Um, if I pay Jeff a payroll, now I can deduct it. And mm -hmm. Jeff would pay tax on it. But if Jeff is below the threshold, then he doesn't have, like he's not going to have taxable income. Right. As opposed to if I gift Jeff the money, let's say that I'm gifting my parent $10,000 a year to help them with expenses, I get no tax benefit and it's taxed at my level. It's the same argument we have when people are paying for their kid's college. And I always say, don't pay for your kid's college. Have them work for your business instead because you're gonna get them $12,000 at least of free money and more likely than not, it's gonna be way cheaper than you. Like if, if Jeff is in the highest bracket and he's paying 37% versus his son who he could be paying through his company and his son is paying, you know, maybe he's paying his son's college and it's $50,000 a year. His tax bracket is going to be, he's going to have a standard deduction plus mm -hmm. any other, maybe he's putting money in an IRA. He might be at 12%. You know, it's going to be substantially less than Jeff's. And that's, that's why we always say it's a good idea to get those kids in there. Somebody says, uh, what about what ages of the kids? There's actually court cases where the children as low as, uh, as young as nine are being paid. If you're using them in advertising, that's active income. So if you're using them and you start using them in your uh, brochures, on your website, in your social media, uh, and you're using your child like with your logo or they're doing cute things, uh, you know, everybody gets annoyed by that, but it gives you an opportunity to pay them. Some people really like that. They're like, hey, they're people. 
human beings novel concept right so, so we have people ask about well can i just 1099 them instead of putting them on payroll the problem with that is that standard deduction does not reduce self-employment income right so you pay i pay my son toby twelve thousand dollars he's guaranteed at least eighteen hundred dollars of self-employment tax on mm -hmm. that twelve thousand some people are funny. It's 12,550 now, so Ricardo. Ricardo, by the way, he had kids working less than 10 years old, working for a CPA firm, cleaning, shredding, to get a full-time shredder. Now he, was, he had a CPA practice. The question is, can they do reasonable activities and are they doing it? Are you keeping time, track of time, et cetera? What I suggest to people is that they either use their kids directly in their advertising or they find something that their kids are really good at that they suck at. So for example, social media, that's where everybody is better. Anything that's tech, get, excuse me, get your kids involved and let them do it. Uh, if you pay your kids $50,000 through work, how do you prove that the work was worthy of 50,000? I think at that point, you're gonna have to produce time records and things of that nature. Uh, and, and descriptions of the work, of your job titles, what kind of work they were doing what you do is either do the work ahead of time or you're going to end up doing more work afterwards. If you do it ahead of time, you say, here's what I want you to do. Uh, here's how I'm going to pay you. And then here's a reasonable amount for that type of uh, job. If you're doing it after, then you're just going to have to make sure you have good record keepings. But reasonable pay is all over the place. There's uh, executives who believe that reasonable pay is $4 million dollars an hour at some points. Like you have these ridiculous amounts and you think I'm kidding. Uh, when the, um, when the uh, tobacco cases were being settled, it was literally like $40,000 an hour in some cases, uh, hundreds of thousand dollars an hour for some of these guys, um, men and women, a man, a woman, whatever, <laughs> whatever, a mango. I heard that, a wool mango, uh, if anybody gets that. The, uh, but they had all these different scenarios and it's all over the place. It used to be that the IRS wanted you to get paid less then they wanted you to get paid more. Now they're pushing back and like, there's, mm -hmm. there's just so much gray area. If anybody says they know, they don't. What you wanna do is have a reasonable basis for your argument. So if you're, again, if you have the kids, you're not paying them, you know, hundred bucks an hour to sweep. What you do is say how much for reasonable cleaning and then uh, they do something like that. Uh, I know somebody says concern, Joyce, we had everybody here get tested and Jeff and I even talked about whether we would sit near each other. Some people are worried about uh, the COVID situation. Uh, we are very careful, everybody walks around, Jeff's mask, my mask. We're not putting ourselves at any more risk other than he and I are close to each other. Um, and that's the risk of running a show. Yeah, most of my employees are at home to protect them from. We have about 300 people here in Vegas and I would imagine that we have less than a dozen that actually come into the office. Everything we're doing is we're out. But then there's people that they don't have that choice. Amazon, et cetera, those guys mm -hmm. that are out there hoofing and, uh, and running. So now I get it. Um, and it's just being reasonable. So I appreciate your concern, absolutely. And take it serious. Uh, can we add the minor to the title and still be able to remain, yeah, still be able to probably receive the step up benefit? Uh, do you want to go over what they're talking about here? Okay, here's what I think they're talking about. Uh, and you may have a different idea. Uh, when you uh, purchase an interest in a partnership, you get a step up of, of basis in the assets. Uh, if it's just gifted to you or uh, sole proprietorship, it, it, that doesn't happen. But when you when you purchase an interest or somebody dies and you receive their their interest in a partnership, you can get that step up in basis. Yeah, and I, I think on some of this that they might be talking about the house too. So what we see is people will slap their kids on the house thinking that they can avoid um, transfer issues with probate. So mom and dad have a $100,000 house that becomes a $500,000 house. And um, dad passes away, mom still has house and then adds son to the house as a joint tenants with rider survivorship. Might this be a, a Proposition 19 question? It's gonna be, I bet you. It's like, we have another one coming up, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're thinking the same thing. 
What I tell people is I don't encourage that. And the reason that you don't encourage that is because people that you gift things to receive your basis in it. So go back to that same example, mom and dad, they have a basis of $100,000, dad passes away. Technically there's a step up in basis on at least dad's half. So whatever the house is worth, let's say it's worth a half a million dollars at that point. Depending on the state you're in, that could be as high as a $500,000 step up or it could be his half. So his half would be a $200,000 step up over the 100,000. So $300,000 basis. I know this gets confusing, but let's say the house is now worth a million dollars. You put your kid on there. They have a $300,000 basis in a house that's worth half a million dollars. If you do not and mom passes, the child would get a step up in basis for a million dollars. And then they could sell that house and they would have zero tax as opposed to $700,000 of capital gains. So I tend to say, don't do that. There's other reasons. Uh, there's some um, asset protection reasons why you don't do it. Uh, son gets, you put son on your house, son unbeknownst to you enters into a bad land deal, loses lots of money, goes through divorce, hits a bus full of nuns. You fill in the blank, son gets liability. Now they're gunning for your house and there's not homestead. So uh, because it's joint tenants and the son's probably not living there unless you guys are all living together, uh, but it gets, it gets to be an issue. So can you add and remain with step up and basis? I don't believe so. Do you see any section 121 problems with adding a, a minor? They have to live in it and they have to be on title for two years. So you always have an issue when you put a minor, unless they're living with mom, unless they're living with dad. So, uh, and section 121 being the uh, exclusion of gain when you mm -hmm. sell your primary residence. Yeah, somebody says, uh, pay kids via sole proprietorship is the money deducted from the parent's income. Yeah, it's from the sole proprietor's income, which would end up on the 1040. Right. So yes, it lowers your income, moves it over to the child. Classic. Actually, yeah, it'll also reduce your self-employment income. Classic income shifting. And then somebody says, what's the difference between paying a kid in a C-Corp versus an LLC? If you've been around for a while, you've done these LLCs don't exist for the tax, um, as far as the tax treatment. So it's an LLC taxed as sole proprietor partnership, S-Corp, C-Corp. So as far as the difference, it really depends on what that LLC is. C-Corp could run payroll just like an S-Corp. The big difference between doing any sort of entity where it's a corporation and uh, versus doing just a sole proprietor when it comes to children is the uh, withholding and the uh, employment taxes. When you're just a sole proprietor, you can pay your kids. You don't have to worry about that. It's their problem. When you run it through a corp, you do the withholding. It's the company's problem yeah. and they do the withholding. Fun stuff, guys. So rolling right along. Uh, do I file my business taxes with my personal income? So probably on my personal tax return because I didn't make any money this year and just paid out a lot. Jeff, you like these. Can I say it depends? It depends on what that business is, how it's formed. Uh, if it's a sole proprietor, then it certainly gets uh, filed with your personal tax return. Uh, but it could be a partnership. It could be an S corporation, which... Again, it's going to eventually flow through to you personally. Uh, could be a corporation, a C corporation, where uh, that's a completely separate entity. So, uh, yes, you could. It's possible that you do file it with your personal, but it's also possible that it files its own return. Mm -hmm. It all depends. Uh, if you lost money, it doesn't matter really whether you lost money. It depends on how the entity is taxed. Mm -hmm. Where it could end up on your personal returning, do some benefit is if you're a partnership in which you're a material participant, if you're a sole proprietor, if you're an S corp and you have basis, then those profit, those losses could end up on your return. I can just tell you, it doesn't matter what type of entity you are, if you, if, if as to whether uh, losing money, whether you, whether you, whether it goes on your personal or not. So it, it makes no difference. The question is whether the loss is something you can take individually. And uh, if you know what the hobby loss rule is, section 187, it basically says you have to make money two out of five years or you're presumed to be a hobby. 
and if you are presumed to be a hobby, then your losses cannot be taken and offset your active, your, your, your personal income. That's all it means. Everybody says, no, it makes your business a hobby. Well, it just means that your expenses cannot exceed the income. So if I'm a photographer and I make $10,000 a year doing photos and they say you're, it's a hobby, you're not really, uh, it's not really a trader business, it's not what you do, then the maximum amount of deductions I get is $10,000. And if I spent 12,000, 2,000, would it just carry forward or would I lose it? Uh, I, I think it's lost. I think it's permanently suspended. So it just, it gets suspended, so it goes away. The one entity that is not subject to that rule is, uh, or I guess there's more, but the one for-profit entity is a yeah. C-Corp. So C-Corp, you can have losses and it just carries forward. You don't get to use it personally unless you uh, liquidated the company and said, I'm done with this. So, uh, so the answer to your question is, do I file business taxes with my personal because I didn't make any money and just paid out a lot? No, it doesn't make any difference. It depends on how you set up that business as to how it gets, it gets paid. Uh, fun one. How long after the sale of a primary residence do you have to apply the proceeds to a new home purchase to avoid taxation? I had this question from my mother a few years back. Mm -hmm. um, this actually relates to a law that ceased to exist in 1998. <laughs> there is uh, no law. Uh, it used to be, if you remember, it was the, what, the 50 year old rule uh, that uh, as long as you kept purchasing a, a residence more expensive than your last one, you could defer any gains. Mm -hmm. And then once you reach 50 or 55, uh, you could defer, permanently defer a certain amount. Mm -hmm. uh, that was replaced by what we call code section 121, where you can exclude up to $250,000 of gain if you've lived there two out of five years. If you're married friendly jointly, you can exclude up to half a million of cool. gain. Yep, and there's no requirement that you spend it on another house. So if you Correct. just wanna sell a home and take the money and you know, go on vacation, you can. Yeah, if you got a million dollar home and you got a basis of 500 grand in it, you sell it and... Yeah, $500,000 gain. If you're married, filing jointly and you lived in it two of the last five years. And, and this is the one that trips people out. It's two of the last five. It's not the last two years. It's two of the last five, which means you could rent it for three years and still go back and capture it. You can only use that rule, however, once every two years. But now we have something else since we've just run it for the last three years. Now we could possibly exchange it. Yeah, yes. And we talk about that quite often. That you've Now you have 121 exclusion and 1031. And yes, you could do both on a property. So do you want to go over a scenario just to be, because um, you probably have some folks that are in this 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 boat, given that real estate <coughs> keeps yeah, going up. Yeah, I have a house that I paid 200 for and I sold it for 800. I'm single, so I only get 250 deduction. So you bought it for 200. Yep. I'll write that down, 200. And you sold it for how much? 800. You you must be rich, this is sold. I'm old, so I've had this house for a really long time. Sold for 800. So there you have $600,000 a gain and you get 121 exclusion of 250,000. So you're going to have taxable gain of 350,000 mm -hmm. capital gain. But did I mention I stopped living in it back in 18? Mm -hmm. And I've been renting it out for the past two years. So now Jeff could do what? He could 1031 exchange it. So I don't have to pay tax on that. So does he still get the $250,000? This is real, right? Yep. This is a two, so, so, so Jeff, does not have to pay capital gains on $250,000 because he lived in it two of the last five years. So he gets his 250 and that steps up his basis. So he bought it for 200. So his new basis is $450,000. And are you going to 1031 it? I'm going to 1031 it. I found somebody else who wants it and I found another piece of property I want. So he's going to 1031. He's going to sell it for 800. So he's going to have to buy $800,000 of new property. Even though 
his gain would be 350,000. Mm -hmm. So so Jeff by doing this is going to save himself the way that he did this. He's going to save himself what about tax on 600,000 about $120,000 yeah. plus you'd probably have the uh, you'd have a little bit of recapture, some capital gain recapture, small amount. Now if you're asking what happens if I only buy a $700,000 house Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've received a, basically $100,000 worth of proceeds. And unfortunately, every dollar of that's going to be capital gain. Yep. Would you have some depreciation? Would you have some depreciation, which you can never offset with a 10 Don't million. you love accountants? <laughs> but what about the, 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 the two years of capital? Yeah, two years of capital gains, the, the nothing. Oh, by the way, what if Jeff didn't take any capital gains? or not capital gains, but what if Jeff didn't take any depreciation? He just said, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sell some, somebody says, could I keep some of the boot? There's Doug. Uh, no, but what if Jeff uh, just doesn't to take any depreciation? He rents it to his kid and he says, you know what? I'm not gonna take any depreciation. It's too complicated. Does he have to do recapture? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. Don't think that you get away with it. Somebody says, is 121 exclusion 250 for each person? Or for non-spouse, you and son, 500k. It depends on whether you and whether you live in it, and whether it's jointly titled. So you have to own it and live there two of the last five years. So even when you have divorces, there's rules that allow you to like. I think we have two years. Yeah, somebody says, "What about this? Uh, what, if, what happens if Jeff hurries up and has a Vegas wedding to get a larger deduction? Two of the last." Five years you had to live there and it has to be titled in your name. So if Jeff goes out and gets married, is there an automatic $500,000? No. no. Had to live there two years, has the, to be in your the name. The new wife also has to have the two years. Yep. Yep. Can vacant land be utilized for a 1031? Yes. Yep. You can. And then somebody says, can you do a 1031 on a primary residence? No, unless you make it into a investment property, which is what Jeff did. He rented it somebody else for two years. So technically you do it for six months, six months to a year. Jeff will probably say a year. I'd probably say six months. See, someone's trying to help you out. <laughs> See, that's why we love you guys. They're helping. Helpful. Let's see. Uh, what do we have next? Do I file my business? Wait. Did you skip one? I don't know what I did. Did I miss one? I got that. Oh, there's that. Oh, this is what we get to talk about. I'm teaching a class with Aaron Adams. Nice. We are going over all of our fun stuff that's been going on since COVID started and uh, kind of a some ideas for 2021. I have some definite opinions on this. If you have not been listening to us for the last year, definite opinions on it because I get so ticked off at what's been going on in the real estate world and leaving behind such a huge section of society. Uh, I have the stats to back it up and I have reality and we see it all the time. There's literally, we've been catering to folks that are making over $75,000 a year for the, you know, for those of us who are landlords and we see a ton of it. And where we're really suffering right now is livable, uh, livable affordable. properties, affordable properties that are, yeah, that aren't slum. Right. You want good quality somewhere south of $1,000 a month and you still wanna make money at them. That's what we're good at. I have a ton of those. Between, just so you get an idea, between Aaron and I, we have over 3,000 properties managed or owned. Um, Aaron has several hundred. I, myself and Clint have a couple hundred and this is what we do. So if you wanna join, come on over and uh, and it's free. There's the link. Patty probably sent that out to everybody. No cost, just come on and join. It's so much fun. We love talking real estate. All right, can Jeff use the $800,000 of gain? So we're back to this guy here. So we had that $800,000 of property sold. Somebody's asking, can he do that and use that for multiple properties? Yes, it's just real estate. So he could buy land and two condos. He could buy uh, a bunch of mobile homes that are attached to the ground. So they're considered stick build. He could buy the pads for them. He could go buy an apartment building. He could go buy 10 single family residences. It doesn't matter so long as it's real estate. Somebody says, does this 
121, 1031 exchange scenario work, uh, where did it go? If you have a multifamily house and you're living in one of the units for at least two of the last five years, it does on that portion of the home. Mm -hmm. So you would break it into two. Like you'd say, let's say it's a duplex, half of that house and half of the value would qualify under 121 because that was the house that, that you lived in as a primary residence for two of the last five years. Makes sense? Yeah, and we've actually had some of those where we've had a duplex that was sold for quite a bit of money and they lived in half and rented out the other half. And we had a 1031 on one side and a 121 on the other side. Mm -hmm. Somebody's asking how I answer. I'm trying to go off of, we have about 88 open questions uh, that are out there. Somebody unmuted themselves. Um, we are going to be going over all that. Uh, what is, somebody says, we'll be answering ongoing questions that come up. On Saturday, for sure, uh, we'll be going 9 to 5 Pacific Standard Time, and uh, we'll go over that. And then the questions, I have chat and Q&A over here. Our guys are going through all the q and I'm trying to see if there's any that pop up that have to do with the questions that we're on, just in case somebody's asking a clarifying question. Otherwise, they're answering all the questions. Um, and uh, we have lots of stuff. So there we go. Emma, join us. We always have a good time. You will not be sorry because usually there's somebody who's really smart, at least in the chat, to, to tell us good things that are really <laughs> smart. Uh, no. uh, can you convert 1031 to a personal residence? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then 121 has a special rule that if you did that, you have five years to wait before you can use one, uh, the 121 again on that property. So the, the, the code anticipates that you're gonna do this. Again, if you're paying taxes and you're involved in real estate, it's because you're choosing to, not because you have to, more than likely. Uh, does the 1031 exchange work if your property is fully depreciated? Yes. You're just rolling your old basis into the new. You die, steps up in basis, kid redepreciates it all again or whoever inherits. That's why we love real estate. Um, I am 70 years old. Is this you again? I'm I sent this one in. <laughs> I'm 70 years old and haven't made a deposit to my Roth in 10 years. So usually I just make fun of Jeff and you guys cannot see that I, the joy on my face. You might hear it in the voice. No, Jeff. You haven't made any account, account cracks. I'm, oh, I, you have. You I, have. I, I'm actually older than Jeff. A lot of you guys don't realize it. Oh, you are. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just fishing here. I'm catching me a big Jeff. All right, I'm 70 years old and haven't made a deposit to my Roth in 10 years. I probably am. Uh, what year were you born? I got kids older than you. I'm just teasing you. All right, I'm 70 years old and haven't made a deposit to my Roth in 10 years. Am I free to withdraw all my account with no penalty or am I limited to my cost basis? Well, the first thing I notice is obviously you've had this Roth for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you're over 59 and a half. Um, so once you've had it for five years and you're over 59 and a half, you can, you can pull it. every penny of it out. Mm -hmm. But then you don't have protected income stream. So if you leave it in there, it grows. You're not going to pay any tax. But if you take it all out. Uh, is the Roth IRA protected from creditors? Uh, in some states, there's protections. Like most states, there's some protection. Not in all states is there complete protection. Okay. If you have real estate in it, no. The real estate flows through to you, the liability. So when I see people with Roths and they're doing real estate, usually we're gonna say, please put an LLC, have the Roth set up an LLC. It's a specialized kind of LLC that's owned by an exempt entity and then put that in, put that in there. But um, it's pretty hard to get to an IRA. And it's one of those things. And a lot of, a lot of states, uh, you have low homesteads, like California has a pretty low homestead. Um, most lawyers aren't going after your house because they know that you'll probably burn it down before they get anything of value. And it, it and it's really, really tough. Like cars and stuff, there's people that'll go after it. And they'll always say, man, we go after it. I have seen people that have lost their homes and lawsuits, but it is so remote. Usually if you're in a knockdown drag out, you're, you're leveraging the house to pay the attorneys. Mm -hmm end of the day, they're getting nothing. So there's not really much of an incentive for them to go over those types of things. I did liquidation for years growing up uh, with AAA liquidating and we would go and we would 
we did police auctions, we'd auction off creditor stuff and 10 cents on the dollar because you know people are coming in, they have no idea what they're getting. Um, the funny one is when people that had their cars that were gonna get you know, jacked, they would take parts out of the, out of the engine keep them and then send somebody in there to buy it at the auction for nothing and then they put the pieces that made it operational again uh we had a taxpayer in ohio who bulldozed this business to keep irs from taking it not realizing that he still owed the money that he owed them oops he had, now has no business and he still owes them however much they, they they took the uh the heavy equipment that he used to bulldoze yeah. it all right uh, somebody says for a 1031 exchange, going back to that 1031 exchange, I know that there's a whole bunch of 1031s and I can see it really easily when they pop up, but does the property purchase have to be titled in the same name entity as the property sold? The answer is yes, same entity. That's why it's really tough to do those in partnerships. How does the 1031 exchange work if the property you buy is worth more than the one you sell? It rolls your basis of the previous property into that to the value of that property the rest of it would be new basis on top of the, the new property. And if you got that, it means you're a nerd. <laughs> and, and what's really important with these 1031 exchanges is you can't touch the proceeds. Uh, you need to talk to what they call a qualified intermediary mm -hmm. and they will take care of everything for you. The, per, the sale, sale of your property, the purchase of the new property. Mm -hmm. so. Look at this one. I have an LLC taxed as a sole proprietor. But first year income has zero. So I have zero income. Can I deduct my office up to 300 square feet and auto mileage? Jeff. And the answer is yes. I'm assuming this is, a, well, it does say sole proprietor, Schedule C. Uh, so you can deduct your office space. You're going to do a simplified method of, uh, it sounds like a $5 a square foot. So that's a $1,500 deduction. Uh, and when I say auto mileage, I'm talking business auto mileage. It has to be associated with, with your LLC. Uh, it can't be going to Starbucks and picking up lunch that you're also trying to deduct. And so the IRS, like this is a good one. It's beginning of the year. Write down your odometer statement. In order to actually write mileage off, you have to have your beginning odometer, ending odometer, and then you're tracking which trips were for what? Use tax uh, mileage, I, mileage IQ. IQ. Yeah, use mileage IQ because it'll GPS you everywhere. And then you could say, these trips here are between offices. These trips here are definitely business. These trips here are personal. It's like the tender of driving, swipe right, swipe left. And... Jeff is so gross. And so <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're hooking up with your mileage yeah. app. That's when we know Jeff has just gone too far. Don't hook but up. yeah, it does make it really easy. Um, but all you're doing is you're determining, like this year it's 56 cents a mile for 2021. It was 57 and a half cents a mile in 2020. What was it? Uh, 58 cents in 2019. It's been going down. Energy prices have been going down. So in theory, the IRS has given you a, <laughs> they're saying, hey, it's getting less expensive to drive, which I think is absolute crap. Um, and then somebody says, well, what if you have lost? Do you have to carry it forward? No, if it's a trader business, you get to take it and offset your other income. Mm -hmm. So the hobby loss rule is only, it's a presumption, it's a rebuttable presumption. So Clive Barker, Midnight Train to Georgia, right? I think mm -hmm. we were talking about that, or herbs and rye, peaches and herbs. Peaches, peaches and, and herbs, herbs and, and rye. That's a restaurant. Peaches and herbs, right? So Clyde Barker uh, made tons of money and then he wanted his kid to be the next uh, hip hop star. So he spent about $38 million over 10 years trying to start a uh, record label. He lost money every year. The IRS contested it saying it was more of a hobby. He was just trying to help his kid. And uh, Clive won because he could show that he was trying to make a profit. That's all you gotta do, you gotta show. So it's not automatic, it's two out of five years you're presumed to be a hobby. And then you rebut that by showing the first two things they ask you is, do you have a lawyer and do you have an accountant? Mm -hmm. Literally, that's the first two things. Did you hire somebody, professionals to help you with it? Uh, so at times the home office deduction may get um, suspended until you have income. It's, when it's when a, would that be? It, it's usually if you already have losses and you're taking the indirect expenses, uh, they're gonna suspend a, a, a portion, if not all, of that loss until you have income to offset it. So there might be a question as to, but the, the mileage for sure. The mileage definitely. 
and then the, the, the home office, when you're a sole proprietor, this is the big difference between being a sole proprietor and having some sort of uh, taxable entity in your life, like an S-Corp, C-Corp, LLC tax, an S-Corp, LLC tax is a C-Corp, even a nonprofit, is when you are an employee of an organization and it reimburses uh, for your home office space, that's just not taxable to you and it's a mm -hmm. deduction. It's not a home office deduction anymore. It's an administrative office, but it's, it's, it's business use of personal property. And when you're an employee, the business can just reimburse you for the reasonable cost and you get a lot more out of it and you don't have any issues. Right. The, the business would take the loss. Um, and, and I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to take that deduction because I can't really use it. Mm -hmm. It's better to take it and have it suspended or, or whatnot than mm -hmm. to just lose it forever. And... Uh, Absolutely. There's some good questions floating around here. I have to, I keep looking at it. Uh, somebody says, I sold a business in 2020. Any suggestions on how to lower capital gains? You could still potentially, depending on when you sold it in 2020, you could still do an opportunity zone. Uh, we would generally be looking at, like we probably missed it, so I don't want to ruin it for you, but there's some things you could have done to lower the taxes. Uh, I'm, I probably won't tell you because I don't want to... <laughs> mess with you, but you would have done some loss harvesting and, and potentially some uh, giving away of, of monies last year. Yeah, one of the most important things when selling a business is uh, classifying what you're actually selling. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get as much under the capital gains rate, long-term capital gains rates as you can, uh, because some things when you sell inventory and certain other uh, items, they're going to be taxed at ordinary rates. Mm-hmm. Somebody says, will an extension impact my 1244 election? No. No. Uh, do you have to recapture any depreciation if you did a cost segregation and later did a, 12, uh, a 1031 exchange? Everything rolls forward. Right? Uh, yeah, now, you'd have to re do recapture on the 1250, the real estate portion. I think there's the a- 1245, I don't think so. 1245, but I, I, don't, I don't think, I, I believe it all rolls forward. I, I remember looking at that last year, but- I'm 90% certain. Casey, send that in as a uh, as a question. I believe that you're you're going. Somebody says, "Hey, I don't see the questions." Yeah, it's because people's names on it, so I don't want to. That's why we give you Q and A. Yeah. So when I when you see Q and A, it just means that I'm I'm reading them off and we're just answering a few. So we always throw them up there. I used to just leave the questions up, and then people would be like, "You're not answering the question." Like, well, I'm answering this one over here. Are there any case studies on deducting groceries as a business expense? Case studies, none that I'm aware of. Uh, deducting groceries you can do if it's, if it's business related, if you're giving, buying snacks for your employees, if you're buying food that you're serving to clients, uh, things of that nature. If you're buying groceries to feed either yourself or your family, it's not going to be deductible. There was one that was a case and it was a guy and he was doing um, presentations in his home. I think he was doing insurance or something like that. And he'd invite people into his house and his wife would go out and buy all the groceries and cook. Yeah, you can write that off because you're providing it to a third party. But can you just write off your groceries? No, it has to be an ordinary and necessary business expense. And uh, yeah, groceries is not going to be it. This is the classic example of when you get yourself into trouble, especially when we're talking piercing the corporate veil. If you yeah. use personal expenses, do not go shopping at Safeway or Smith's or uh, whatever they call it in your state. Don't go Ralph's, <laughs> whatever whatever happens to be, Windisk Dixie, that's another one. Yeah. Um, Piggly Wiggly. Piggly Wiggly, Pathmark, I remember that when I was growing up. Um, don't go shopping for your personal groceries with a business card. Now you're mixing and that's going to be used against you if you get into a knockdown drug uh, uh Let's see if there was a... Da, 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 da. Good news is um, I know there's at least one state, I believe it's Minnesota, who offers you a grocery credit on your tax return. That's nice. Huh? Up to $300, I believe. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's go to another one. Do I miss one? All right. Yep. That was that. All right. I know that forgiven PPP loans are not taxable. So you get a loan from a bank, it's the paycheck protection, you use it for qualified deals, 
And the CARES Act says you do not have to recognize the cancellation of indebtedness as taxable income. What about grants received under the CARES Act? And specifically, when they talk about grants, they must be talking about emergency grants, which is the economic injury disaster loans, which are the, uh, what they, they, mm -hmm. they basically capped at 150,000, although Congress said they could go up to 2 million. But those were loans where they're long-term loans. So the loans are not uh, taxable. Uh, the grants, as far as I know, there's no provision to keep them from being taxable. They added it. They added it oh, to they the did new, add yep. it. They so. added it and they said, it's not taxable. Moreover, you would use the grant to offset your PPP loan. And that was my concern because mm -hmm. that if you got the $10,000, you actually had to reduce your PPP by that, correct? Yep. And then are there government grants to relieve financial dress received by a medical practice under the CARES Act considered taxable income? And the answer to that is, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't believe that they're taxable, but I'd have to look at it specifically. Um, that's one where give us the specifics about it and let us go look at it. But I don't believe that any of the monies that you received are taxable. The question becomes whether when you receive those monies, if they are a loan or if there's a payback and if that payback is, is forgiven, the question is whether you are within the carve out where they said you can deduct expenses from that. Yeah, I'm sure there's probably carve outs for like uh, COVID related medical uh, vaccinations, things of that nature that mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're frankly just not aware of those specific, specific uh, issues. Yeah, so somebody's asking uh, medical practices receive grants via HSS CARES. I do not believe that that's taxable income. And then the only question is whether you can write off expenses with it. Uh, are COVID-19 uh, stimulus payments made to every man, woman, child taxable? That is a refundable tax credit. So it is not taxable income. It is considered a tax credit and you're just getting it ahead of time. And it's actually for 2020. And I believe now, no, it's still 2020. Yeah. And they're just giving it to you early and then they just increased it. So you actually get more and they could do it again. Uh, can we apply for the next SBA IDLE loans with the one without employees? Yes. Uh, what you do is you amend. So if you already applied for one, you amend it. I, I just did one earlier today where uh, due to the ongoing crises, they were adding it. And then the PPP, you'll be able to uh, seek again. I don't know when that opens uh, off the top of my head, but I believe that you're going to be able to go back in. If your business year over year fell 25%, uh, quarterly taxes, and there might be some other periods of time you could use. But if you've suffered, then the idea is that you can go back in and get more PPP loan. But we'll have more on that. That that just passed. And uh, it took, I want to say about a year to get all the interpretations out of, no, it's not, it was, it was in March and we just started getting it towards the end of the year. Yeah. So March 23rd it, till today. 27th, right? 20, Whatever it was, it was March and it took us all the way up until the end of the year to get, like we still have questions lingering that the yeah. treasury is trying to respond. Uh, somebody said, uh, as a real estate salesperson, is it advantageous to have an LLC or just file a 1099? So do you wanna answer this one? Okay, I'm just gonna give my point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. Tax wise, it's not gonna make any difference. Uh, but I do like that added protection of the LLC, especially since we're dealing with real estate. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw one thing at you. What if you're a sole proprietor and you make $100,000 as a real estate agent versus being an S-corp? I'm going to suggest you become an S-corporation. Yeah, because you're going to save a ton on the self-employment tax. Right. So if you're a, a sale, real estate salesperson and you say, should I be an LLC or just file a 1099? They're not... Like you can be an LLC that files a Schedule C. You could be an LLC that files a S Corp return. You could be an LLC that tax files a C Corp return. You could be an S Corp or you could be a C Corp. Like mm -hmm. You could be a partnership if you have somebody else in it. The question really comes down to, is it just you? Do you have the ability to put that money through an entity to lower taxation? The entity is important just to keep you from getting sued. And with COVID, I would just suggest everybody operate as an entity if you're in real estate, period, because all you have to do is find yourself drawn into some drama where somebody alleges that they contracted COVID, 
either at one of your showings, one of the houses that you have listed or somebody that's in your care. Um, the biggest issue then runs over is, is the tax side and whether it makes sense. And right around 25 to $30,000, you start to see about a $1,500 difference and it'll continue to grow the closer you get to about 140,000. Uh, and you'll see that the more you make between about 25 and 140, the more you should just be doing an S corp. And so if you're making a hundred thousand bucks, the difference tax wise every year, it ends up being about 14% of $7,000 or 70,000. So that would be right around uh, 10,000 bucks that you will put in your pocket versus if you just operated as a sole proprietor. And the reason is, is because an S corporation, you only pay old age disability and survivors insurance and Medicare on your salary that you pull out of the entity. The rest of the money that falls down to you without getting into a ton of specifics is not subject to those taxes. And so it ends up, you know, you end up doing a ton better. Um, so if you are a person that you say, hey, as a as an agent, I can't be paid as an entity. They have to pay me. There is a way under tax law to move it into an S corp. Even under those circumstances, you have to meet a two prong test that we can happily uh, show you how to do that. If you wanted to uh, reach out to us, we'll show you how to do it. We love working with real estate agents. Somebody asked uh, when they're a real estate professional whether if they're a hard money lender, whether that money or whether that time computes, it just moved, but it was up there at one point. Um, whether that counts towards their... So when I see real estate sales, first, the only reason I bring that one up is because when you're a real estate professional, it's buying and selling or developing mm -hmm. or doing construction on properties. Technically it's not lending. So even being a hard money lender, I would say, no, that doesn't qualify as right. real estate professional. Yeah, real estate financing does, does mm -hmm. not count it towards that time. Angie's giving me a hard time. It's the Fleischer case. Yes, that's very good. See, he's making fun. I think Angie must be an accountant. Yes, I, I usually forget that for what, there's like holes in my brain and there's certain cases that for whatever reason, I can just never remember. I was gonna guess, but then I, I usually say Fletcher instead of Fleischer for whatever reason. I just can't, that one just evades me. Uh, la, 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 la. Let's see, under code section 280A, C5, the home office deduction is limited to the activities gross income reduced by all their deductible expenses that are allowable regardless of qualified use and by the, uh, da, 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 da. so that, all right. That might be what you guys were talking about, uh, about the limitation on the sole proprietor, uh, whether you have a home office. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. Perfect, thank you. So we have good accountants out there helping us out. What is the best way to write off a cruise? So all the accountants probably just started sweating and eye twitching. You can't write off a cruise as a cruise. The only time you could even do a business cruise is if it's a US registered vessel. Yep. I think there's like one or two of them in the world. And only sailing to U.S. ports. Only U.S. ports, so you can't touch Canada or Mexico or the you know Caribbean. Um, I think that you might be able to do one in Hawaii, and then you have to have your itinerary. And you have to show that you're the prime. I think you have the um, bunch of hoops you have to jump through. Primary. It, it is a bunch of hoops, and your deduct. And we're talking about conventions, seminars, things mm -hmm. of that nature. But here's what's fun: you and can use a cruise ship. To travel. to travel. And I actually learned this from an IRS attorney. And we went and we talked, we gave a talk in Cosmo on the beach in a tiki hut for half a day. I think we did five hours on the beach in a tiki hut. And he drank way more than I did. But we were arguing tax stuff. They said, here, you got to do something that's way different than you'd normally do in the US. And they got him liquored up and he was telling stories. And so uh, the travel to Cosmo and back, you can use any reasonable methods. You can use airplane. If, if we could, we could have done a train. Uh, you could have driven mm -hmm. or you could take a cruise ship. 
cruise ship then becomes deductible. There's some limitations. It's twice the federal max. Yeah, and, and it, it's crazy because it changes depending on the time of year. It changes because the feds put out their per diem amounts. For luxury travel. For No, it's not luxury. It's any travel. So it, okay. it, it's it's your travel and lodging, and then you just double that up. So you get about 800 bucks a day. So the first method we talked about, the conventions, seminars, whatever, that is limited to $2,000. Uh, now, when traveling by cruise line, they do recommend uh, that it's from destination or from start to destination, not stopping at Grand Turks and Aruba mm -hmm. and everything else in between. But as long as it's the same price, I'm doing it. And there's no <laughs> time limitation. It's just reasonable accommodation. And, and then make sure your food's, Karen's saying, Costa Maya. Were you at one where like Scott came down? You know who I'm talking about? That'd be pretty funny if we had people that were actually on that cruise that are listening. Um, but I went down and I've, I've done it a couple times where you end up cruising off someplace and you're like, all right, we have to be here. What's a cool way that we can get here? Yes, went to several of the cruises. That's how you do it. So you're not writing off a cruise anymore. You're writing off your travel. And that's the joy. If you want, you do that with an RV too. A lot of people try to write off RVs. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Uh, somebody says the Honolulu when it gets going again. So they've done it in CL, mm -hmm. Norwegian Cruise Lines. That's the only one that I know of. Uh, where you where you can actually ride off the cruise and then you have to have an itinerary. Do it with somebody that that's what they do. Like, you know, and then make sure you have your documentation because I think you actually have to attach it. Um, are there such thing that you can restructure your assets to qualify for college scholarship or is this a scam? More than likely it's a scam. And what they're doing is they're trying to make themselves look like they don't have assets I forget what they were doing. They were doing some goofy stuff to qualify for some need-based. Uh, you put your assets in our name for just 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> mm, all right. Here's one that a lot of people were interested in. Uh, devastated by Prop 19 in California, which was, uh, it actually, there's some really good benefits to it for people that have been hurt by the wildfires. We actually have an accountant here who lost her house in the wildfires um, a few years back. So it's, very real what a lot of these folks are feeling. And they said, hey, uh, used to be, you had a fire, you get replacement value, like you don't have to, you can keep your same low basement uh, basis to your replacement value in the same county. So if you left California, you would lose it. Or if you moved outside of that county, now you can move up to three times because of these situations and keep your primary basis. So Prop 19 is all about property taxes. And uh, the other thing was you would keep uh, under Proposition 13, if Jeff was my, my kid, I could give him my property, whether he lived in it or not, and he would keep my low, low basis uh, for the property taxes. So I could have a property that's worth 5 million bucks Jeff just uses it as an Airbnb and he just rents it out and it's paying next to nothing in property taxes. Meanwhile, somebody who lives in their house next door is paying infinitely more in property taxes. And so Prop, Prop 19 popped up and said, that situation's not fair. We will get let you keep some of that benefit and it's the fair market value plus $1 million. If you give it to your kids, your kids have to live there. And I said kids, right? Because if you leave it to two children, they have to live there. Not one, both is my understanding. And if I leave it to Jeff and Jeff's my child, Jeff would have to live in that house to keep the low, low adjusted uh, basis for uh, property tax. Yeah, no, so I turn it into an Airbnb, Prop 19 smacks me. Yep, you have to live there as your primary residence. Let's see if there's some prop. Uh, I know that there's actually a pretty good, I didn't bring the link with me, but the, the, the uh, Board of Equalization has a pretty good uh, statement on this. And you can just type in Prop 19 uh, BOE mm -hmm. and you will find it. And they have a bunch of Q&A. It just came out and I don't believe it takes effect for another month and a week. I believe it's February 15th. And so what people are doing is they're, they're doing all sorts of weird stuff. There's 
parents who are throwing all their stuff into trust and they think somehow they're gonna they're gonna win out. Oh, Patty just did it. Um, yeah, she just shared out that link and it doesn't work that way. The, the whole idea is that you don't want someone to get priced out of their home. So I bought a house in Long Beach. I bought it for $300,000. It's now being assessed at 1.5. I can't afford the property taxes, so I have to sell it. That's what they were trying to avoid with Prop 13. What it ended up being is I bought the house, I stayed in it, now I'm giving it to my kids. My kids make it into a rental mm -hmm. and they're still paying property taxes as though it was being assessed at 300 grand. That's just not right. Um, so somebody says with holidays, February 11th. Um, okay, we'll take a look at it, but um, I think you guys get the idea. Somebody's asking, my son is 10, can he start an IRA in his name? If he has active income, yes. Um, you have to make sure that they're actually making money. It's very hard for, it's gonna be your business, but you're gonna to have to make sure that they're able to do something uh, to get it. And it's not gonna be much. It might be just a couple thousand bucks a year tops, unless you're using them for, uh, if you have a traditional business where you're able to use them um, for things like advertising, and then it's actually a much higher amount, the, the court cases on it. Uh, say you could actually use Screen Actors Guild rates, which will get you quite a bit. Uh, could you give mileage again? It's 56 cents for uh, a mile for um, 2021. It was 57 and a half cents a mile for 2020. If you have more than five cars, you have to use a different method. You can't do the mileage method. Yay. Uh, somebody says, how long do you have to do a 1031 exchange? Uh, I'll just give you guys this. Uh, you have 45 days to identify replacement pro properties. There's a couple methodologies you could use um, and how you identify them and how you identify which ones would qualify. Right. And you have 180 days to close. You can go backwards and you can actually buy something ahead of time and do what's called a reverse exchange and then sell. But again, you have to use a facilitator to do it. Then you have 180 days to sell. Yeah, you usually want to identify several properties, even if you really have in mind one property. In case something falls through, you have... A People will drag there. you out and they'll know that you're on the crunch. So you need to be very, very transparent. Uh, somebody says, for Prop 19, how long do you have to live in your current home to qualify to keep the basis of your new home? I don't know. Like you're talking about, I don't know... If, if you're moving, I believe it's statewide now, and I don't know the, whether there's a rule on that, but again, I'd, I'd have to refresh it. Email that in and what we'll do is we'll start getting a stockpile of Q and A for you guys on the Prop 19, uh, where we can go and see if the, whether we can get you a whole one. Uh, FYI, I have a webinar in 30 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Patty. <laughs> Must be 4.30. Yeah, all right. In 2020, I do, I have a bunch of military guys. All right, in 2020, I bought a lot for $16,000, then went under contract with a contract for $110,000 in escrow for draws. House is a single family and currently under construction. Do I claim the purchases as 16,000 and the 110 as first year expenses? It will generate rent in 2021. No, uh, both the 16 and the 110 and however much you ultimately pay to have this house constructed is going to go into the basis of the property. Uh, the one difference being the 16K is going to be the basis of your land, which will not be depreciated. You can't depreciate land. Uh, the 110 plus whatever else you put into the house, uh, that will be your depreciable basis for the property. Uh, you'll depreciate it over 27 and a half years. And, uh, the only way that you'd be able to expense any of this is if you cost sagged the 110,000 of the build of the single family residence and accelerated the depreciation on it. And you'll probably get about $25,000. So it's kind of weird. But they'd have to wait until it's placed in service. You'd have to that. wait until it's placed in service. You're exactly yeah. right. It has, to, it has to become investment property and service before you can mess around with that. So for this year in 2020, you're 100% right. You're not getting to write off anything. Very few things. You may get the property taxes and the insurance, right? Yeah, there, there's times if you have a loan that you can write off the interest and uh, 
or a lot of people just capitalize it into the cost of the house. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions, but I'm gonna have to bust through here because I'm being bad. I will get you guys more on the, the Prop 19. I know there's a lot of questions there. All right, if my S-Corp makes profit beyond my salary and distributions, I have to claim all that income on my property taxes still too, right? Well, let, let's take the distributions out of there because it really doesn't factor in. Uh, you are going to be taxed on the S corporation income, taxable income after your salary and all the other expenses. Yeah. Uh, whether you take distributions or not has no bearing on what's taxable. S corporation, the easiest way to look at it is if Jeff and I own it together, then whatever we take as salary is on us. Whatever an employee takes as salary is on them, right? Then there's profit. And in an S corp, that profit or loss flows out to us proportionately. This is where it gets kind of weird. It has to be proportionate equally, uh, depending on what our interest is. So if it's 70, 30, then I need 70% of the profit mm -hmm. and 30%. The distributions can actually be unequal. It's kind of weird. Um, Although I wouldn't advise no, distributions it. have to be even. Salaries do not have to be even. Salaries don't, but distributions don't. Hmm. I bet you a dollar. What I have to do is the tax allocation. So the distribution oh, of okay. the tax has to be to me. But if I, let's say I make, we make 100,000 and we're 50-50, I could leave my 50 in. You could take your 50 out. Now we just have that weird capital account issue of you took more distributions. I have more uh, money sitting in there that's all it is. It's my money. I could take it out at any time. Yeah. The only time distributions come into play uh, with taxes is you've you've taken out more than you actually have. Have in basis. Yeah. yeah. And then then you're gonna have a capital gain, the joy of capital gains. Um, but anyway, so regardless in this particular case, so they said, hey, if I have profit beyond my salary distributions, what Jeff said was 100% correct, which is distributions don't matter distributions don't change your profit. So if you have profit, period, beyond your salary, that goes without saying, because profit is whatever's left after you take your salary. That is taxable to you, and it flows down to you in proportion to your ownership. And if you've asked this question, a lot of people get confused about it. They think they're only taxed on the amount of money they take out and their salary. Mm -mm. You get taxed on every penny that company earned for you whether you took it or not. Yes, sir. Good job. All right, I have to go jump off and do a, an, another. How bad am I? Oh, uh, I may ask a couple, answer a couple questions here. <laughs> Luke, I know Patty's sweating for me. Um, is, it Air, is an Airbnb property depreciated at the residential rate or the commercial rate? It's, uh, it's actually the commercial rate. Is it commercial it's Airbnb? Commercial it's not considered residential. What if it's more than seven? uh days rentals i think it's still oh i see i think it's still at the commercial rate just like a hotel would be no i think it's i think it's 27 and a half years is uh, it? i think it well, hotel is we're, gonna, we're gonna end this broadcast disagreeing on a couple I, things i think it's seven <laughs> do you have to take a salary in a c-court technically no um, and you don't want to take a salary if you ain't making any money <laughs> but but that, that was kentucky that just came out of jeff if you ain't making any money, did you just say that? I you love that. Know this one now. <laughs> I got you some whiskey for, for Christmas. You did? Yeah. Bourbon. Yeah. Bourbon. Bourbon. I guess I should say it right. Uh, it took a while because I'm not a I don't drink. I'm boring. All right. Anderson. Oh, I drink wine once in a while. All right. Andersonadvisors.com forward slash podcast. If you like listening to this, took a new screenshot. There's always a few podcasts floating around out there. There's your smiling face a couple of times from October. Uh, we will get more uh, answers to you. Our guys stay on and they'll still be answering some of your questions. Or you could always do the fun one of just emailing in tax Tuesday at AndersonAdvisors.com. I'll show that to you in a second. Uh, one last time on Saturday, Aaron Adams and I, we are going over real estate and what to be looking at for this next year. We have some definite opinions on it. Um, if you like these, go into your platinum pour hole. You can see all the replays. And then if you have questions that didn't get answered, um, you just go to tax Tuesday to Anderson advisors. Um, 
couple of really good questions at the very end. What are the pros and cons of accelerated depreciation in California? They don't recognize accelerated depreciation in California. So I guess that would be a con. Uh, federal wise, it could lower your tax. State tax wise, uh, you're looking at a 13% tax, some of you guys. Yeah, so it's, that's not gonna help so much. Um, somebody says, if somebody already put their, oh, that disappeared. So uh, answer. Yep, somebody got it already. So I already know. This is awesome. So uh, how would I make money if I create a nonprofit organization? Well, you take a salary out of it, uh, but usually your nonprofit, it's gonna be a growing organization, All right? Uh, somebody says, how does taxation work if I use a bridge loan in conjunction with the 1031 exchange? Doesn't affect your tax at all, I don't believe, unless you took more money out than you had, uh, than you had a loan. So if you have a loan, what you can't do is increase the amount of loan to take cash, so that's called boot, and you end up with some boot, which is taxable. So you can't take a million dollar house that has no loan and get a loan against it during a 1031 and satisfy the 1031. If you took cash, that's taxable to you. All right, send in your questions. If you guys see me looking up, it's because we have three screens in here and we're trying to read them. Um, thank you for spending some time with us. Jeff, thank you for spending some time. Thank you for inviting me. All right, I'm gonna go run and jump onto another podcast. In the meantime, guys, uh, thanks for joining us and have a good one. Have a great beginning of the year. Be optimistic this year. There's plenty of opportunities out there. And as always, sending your tax questions, uh, we'll jump on them. And if you, for whatever reason, are having trouble getting a response, um, just try and try again. We have a lot of folks that are looking at these. We do try to get to every single one, but we get hundreds, so uh, we'll, we'll get it. Thanks again. Yeah, somebody says thanks for Patty and, and Susan and Pio and, and Elliot and Tavia for doing all your stuff on the back. They're answering questions like crazy. I could see 138 answered in writing, uh, another 12 and 104 that we were answering otherwise. So we definitely jump all over these. Thanks guys.